Get started if y'all want to. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for coming to this. Uh, the title of this is The Latest Innovations and Opportunities in Sustainable Rice Production. And uh, I'm sorry about, I guess, introducing everybody. Uh, Elliot Mashman is the District 1, the Missouri District Sales Manager for Rice Tech. In his uh, previous roles, he's worked a lot of, done a lot of consulting on, on row rice uh, in the Missouri Boot Hill. Uh, so he's here today to talk about uh, any questions or take any questions you have concerning the road rice. And I think we all know Dr. Merle Andrews here. Um, one, of his, one of his many hats I guess he has is he does a lot of consulting on the uh, uh, government programs uh, when it comes to uh, alternative irrigation methods and, and the equipment that goes along with it. And uh, I'm with you Blake, the sales agronomist for Ice Tech. And, uh, why I'm here today, I guess, is to talk a little bit about um, the hardware, the uh, the automated systems that you can use in row rice uh, to automate your watering process. Uh, like any roundtable discussion, you know, if all it is is us sitting up here and talking, you're probably not going to get a lot out of it. At any time, if you want to say anything, ask questions, stop us, uh, please do so. Uh, I think we'll start with Elliot. Does anybody have any questions on row rice right off top before we start anything? Like what we're doing or how many people here are growing row rice right now? Uh, how many people, I mean, what's the uh, percentage of your farms are those acres right now? 10%, uh, 20% or just that one or some people are 100% by now or what's your all's experience on any of that? Last year about 70. About 70%? Anybody else? Probably 40. 40. Uh, 60 last year. <coughs> is uh, what, what I've seen is in Missouri, a lot of people are wanting to grow more row rice. Is it just seems like Missouri, how the fields are graded, and how we have all our precision level fields already kind of set up in the 40s and 80s and stuff like that. It seems like it's worked out. It's been adapted a lot quicker in Missouri in some places. Uh, I know Arkansas has continued to grow, but uh, I, don't, I don't know when or all the correct me if I'm wrong, but I'd say 30 or 40 percent of the acres of Missouri are road rice now, aren't they? I don't think it's that high, but it's probably 25, 30. Yeah. And every, and every day there's more and more questions about road rice. Um, just to go in through some of the things like uh, successes and failures. Uh, there's also some do's and don'ts of what I've came up with over the last few years. Um, I think one thing that systems. I think one thing the major question I would get what there. The one question I always get is like, what kind of equipment are you using? And you know, everybody when it says furrow, they're always talking about building beds, um, and that's how we kind of were at first. But uh, what we all kind of do. This is a. Uh, Mr. Cultivator, and then that's uh, what I call Perkins plow on the back. So we're not necessarily building beds anymore. We're more or less just cutting furrows. And uh, everybody has their, every, every farm's different. And what we've all learned is there's many, just because you're doing it one way right here doesn't mean you're right somewhere else. And uh, that goes with fertilization on this rubber ice, and it goes with bed spacing as well. But what I've come to find out that works the best for me is 38 inch rows, uh, which we already have a lot of guys that have 38 inch row equipment in Missouri, so we didn't want to go on changing that. Um, I know some areas guys are doing 60 inch beds, but I've never really got it to work uh, in our area. Um, so we just run these cultivators. A lot of guys are just buying old toolbars now too and just running these on the back. Um, uh, lessons, lessons I learned this year, uh, you know, like you said, you had, everybody had like two or three days to put their rice crop in this year when they got windows and so we were just flying. Um, one thing I learned by mistake was uh, we got a lot of these fields planted and we had no beds in them yet and we were like, all right, and then, it, you know, we just kept on planting, kept on planting and then we're like, we'll figure something out later. Well, we thought, you know, it might rain a little bit and we might be able to get back in the field and pull the furrows again. Uh, well, by the time that did, the rice is already spiking. So you got little, little rice barely coming out of the ground. I was like, well, 
I definitely don't want to run that thing through there and cover up that little rice right now. So we kept on chucking along, spraying, you know, worked out really good. Our all ground equipment had no furs to run over. We just lined them up and just took off spraying. When the rice got to ready to watch, I still call pre-flood time, that four to five leaf, that tiller and rice. Instead of, uh, or then that's the time I was like, well, now we have to pull the furrows. And I was worried about it, but we sit there and put that, that machine right there on this farm right there in Stoddard County. And we put that down and just took off. And that rice, I walked behind the tractor the whole day on that one field, just watching that thing. And it never, never that rice never even checked up. It rolled right back up and we had the pipe thrown out hit the water to it and most of the rice that we even threw out just sprang right back up and rerouted because we already had water going to it and that got me thinking uh i don't know if i'd start out that way this year but a lot of these guys in my area have the big uh the big john deere's with the air carts you know dragging that's a big piece of equipment to be dragging across these beds and just kind of tearing up the beds or your furs so i think a lot of us more with the, the guys that have grain carts really like flat planting those farms. So we're gonna, you know, as long as we're not in the stale seed bed, we're gonna flat plant those farms and pull them furs later on in the year like we did this year. You know, we might get in a bind again too, but it just seemed to work out really well. And the weed control I noticed was, uh, you know, I didn't have to fight all them clods sometimes. You know, sometimes I noticed a lot of them clods that come out and didn't get melted down right away. That's where a lot of my barnyard grass came from and stuff too. Has anybody else got any other piece of equipment that they're using right now? The, kind of similar to this or, you know, I've done the bed thing and I've, uh, I've had some pretty big beds and I've got away with them in places, but I don't advise that. Uh, because, you know, when it gets real hot, you'll start mohawking that rice. You know, it'll just get, it'll almost plumb burn up on top of them beds when, it, when you're trying to push water down there in the middle of summer. I built a tool. Uh, it's kind of just like a roller. Yeah. But I put, I, you call it angle irons. Mm -hmm. I call it a groover. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I knew I couldn't get my beds rowed up in the fall. And uh, and so I just I planted flat and then pulled up behind the drill. Mm -hmm. And I mean, everybody kept saying it was all about the fur. What yeah. about the row? All I did was put fur down. Uh, what road is facing are you on? I'm on 76. 76. But I'm in some heavy, 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 heavy gumbo. Play. Yes. Very low slope. Where we had some lighter dirt, what we did is we pulled it and we turned back around and skipped the middle, you know, just scooted over 38. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Came back. Yeah, I know that some places of the bed spaces worked really well, like wider ones, like heavy dirt. Um, some guys were, I went to another talk while ago and, you know, some guys wanted to put these on ground that they can't really pump or they're pumping a bunch on but uh in missouri i mean we're just kind of picking the reason we're doing is just tillage passes and labor savings uh, i mean i think everybody can agree with me not pulling levees in missouri we don't have the levees too like y'all do in arkansas <clears throat> contour levees we don't have many levees to begin with anyway but they hate them up there so uh you know, in a lot, like I said, all that fields were precision level already, 1%. You know, some of the zero grade fields are even coming back out, and guys are putting slope back in there. And that's another thing that I like on some farms for the grower because then, you know, zero grade fields only going to grow good rice. You know, the beans are miserable on those things, and starting to put the slope back to some of these farms is allowing guys to get in there and grow better bean crops. and. You know, corn prices are high enough. Some guys are willing to try some corn on some of that heavier ground. So that's where my the labor savings, the tillage, and opening up a different crop rotation on your farm. Because some of these zero grade fields in Missouri have been just rice to death. And, you know, we're getting other problems too. Uh, are y'all holding y'all's water in the bottom? Yes. I got some guys, I mean, Tim, uh, Tim's got one guy that doesn't hold water at the bottom, right? And I had one good field that, I had one field that we couldn't hold water on and we still did it, but I had noticeable difference in mine, but it could have been that field too. I didn't see any yield difference. But holding it or not holding it, you didn't see any? I had a couple that I couldn't without pulling the leg. I didn't want to go out there and mess up the bottom of the field. I figured I'd just try it. Yeah. And uh, Worked out good? Yeah. It was I know, I mean, I don't know if Tim wants to talk about it, but I know Daryl's done that for a long time, hadn't he, and had good success with it, never boxed water. 
I've he only got one year experience. Off the bottom, he just refuses to put the <clears throat> water in the bottom. He wants it to drain off. Yeah. I think if I was short on water, trying to get back around, I would hold it. Yeah. So, uh, really, I just hold it just out of on the other fields that we manage, I just hold it just out of pure, just because I feel like I need to hold it. You know, I'm not really, there's no, I mean, obviously, usually that rice is better for me down there, uh, nine out of 10 years down there. I did learn one thing though, uh, I used to, you know, just being from the flood mentality, I used to stick as many boards in there as possible in those wear boxes and back the water up as far as I could. Um, I do still want to do that, but I don't want to do it until I got in another elongation in my rice because I was getting the rice way too growthy and it was, it was actually going down and lodging at the bottom ends and I was just making a mess by pushing that water height up, you know, getting it too deep too quick. That's one of my, that's one of my uh, do's and don'ts, I guess. Another one is too, if you ever think that you're worried about that field watering, don't even second guess yourself. Just re pull the furrows because that's not digging those furrows out later on with shovels and stuff like that is not fun. It's easier just to go through there. And especially with equipment like that, you can run through them furrows really quick. Um, I can, we have a lot of, well, that's a conventional tile, but we, we had a row rice field, and this is in down in Amy's area, down in uh, southeast Arkansas or southeast Missouri, and it's really heavy dirt. This is a really flat field right here on the highway. He's 38 to me. I think he, I think he was 60s, but it was, but you could barely see the beds in there. Um, and we had the field next to it last year, and it's similar results. He always wanted to cut the top side of the field, and then we stopped in the middle, and then cut the plot in the bottom again too. We planted all the way through, and we wanted just to see if there was much difference between the top and the bottom. And on this field. I mean, there was practically, I mean, the top side even actually cut, on 753, it actually even cut better than the bottom side. So, some, I mean, that goes against what you would think, but overall, it was pretty much top and bottom. There was no difference. But that flat, that field was extremely flat. And he also, um, on fertilizer, he, he went and just did like 150 units pre-flood and never came back. And so, I mean, that's one thing. I'm splitting all my end applications up, and I don't know what Tim and Wendell. What are y'all doing on your end applications? Mostly three. Mostly three. Yeah, we do do three, but we're variable some of it down slope. You know, putting about two thirds on the about 130 units on the top and the lower third, maybe on put 70. Yeah. Coming back two more times, but, uh, and then that lower. Third is making more than the top every time still. And Elliot, that field was behind means too. It yeah, that was field behind means, yeah. Yeah. But he did the same thing last year on that other field, which was behind means too. It was behind means too. Yeah, behind means too. And, uh, but you know, this is pretty much similar results on that. But that I mean that's heavy, heavy dirt and uh like I think you can get away with you can get away with different fertilization tactics on some of these fields compared to other lighter dirts, of course. I'd want to spoon feed it. I still would want to split the application on gumbo myself, but he did it. And I mean, I can't argue with his results. <laughs> so, I mean, that goes back to, and just like Chris Henry talked a while ago, and I mean, he tried so many different things and there was no statistical difference, whichever way you wanted to, whichever way you want to feel comfortable doing it, it's, there's no right or wrong answer really, I guess, in this fertilization yet. I know there are, Harky's looking at more information on doing it. I'm sure they'll fine tune it down, but uh, you know, uh, some guys are doing one, some guys are doing two, some guys are doing four. I did four 100 pound shots, but I also think that the top third of the field, I probably should have come back on a lot of those and put another 50 pounds. Yeah. I could see uh, if I lack yield, it was in the top. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's just due to the fact from wet, dry, wet, dry. I mean, you know, a lot of people have been to several of these deals and a lot of people say, oh, we let it dry up before we put our fertilizer back out. But we could, I mean, it just didn't work that way. The more acres we were trying to do it on. And so it, just once a week, we, you know. Yeah. We never let ours dry up. It's, uh, anybody else agree with us? Ryan, did you let yours dry up? You just kept fertilizing. Uh, I 
has ever had a chance to drive. Yeah. 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 Uh, That's true. Uh, we're just, just getting on the schedule. Uh, we, we did three or four uh, splits this year. We did some three-way split, some four-way split. But we, we have, we've been adding uh, 65 pounds at boot, you know, at the normal boot out uh, uh, timing, uh, just on the top third uh, of these fields. So we're not, we're not doing extra boot application on the bottom. Uh, are you saying, are you, I mean, you feel like you're getting utilities, savings, labor savings on this row rice? I mean, is that one of your main reasons yeah, why you started? For sure, it's just a, a term I always use is a, a quality of life value uh, that, that you can't put a number on. It's also hard to put a figure on the labor savings, too, because uh, you know, unless you go to tracking every, every you know, person who works on the phone at the But, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, one, one huge thing is just we've never, never cut a rubber ice field. Uh, Needy bruts. I mean, you're just not, not going to have that. It is wet. You're just the harvest ability is And you're saving, uh, you're trying to keep as much uh, residue following the year, too, right? Well, that's what we're toying with is that is the cover crop rotation. But, um, you know, traditionally, the last several years, we've just been, we've been burning it and then just running that roll cone hipper to refresh on the bed. Running that roller cone one time, and so leaving the disc, which is applied and all that, I know it was still refreshing the beds. But where we're trying to cover crop, we're, we're, doing, we're trying to, you know, to totally no till. And running that same double disc plate, yeah, furrow runner that you yeah. picture of up there. I call them Perkins plows, but that's just because Perkins built some of those up there. and But there's a bunch of other people that build those things nowadays, too. Is there anybody up here all the way that is using Gruber like he's talking about? I've heard of that. Are you from Louisiana? Yeah, I've heard of that. I've heard of it down there. That's interesting. Uh, is there anybody up that way that's never tried that? Not that I know of. Is there? He uses a what one? Like a Gruber like he's talking about where you weld an angle iron on a roller instead of actually plowing. They're just like literally just grooving down in the field with a little hot bed. So it's kind of like, like, like that furrow runner, you know, that Perkins also built that red cone or whatever, but it's on the roller. Yeah, I haven't seen one of those, but I mean, I think they work pretty slick too. Yeah, if it's a real soft combo, I mean, I'd be interested to see what this looks like. The only one I've seen up there is where when they first started grading some of those flat fields, they were in the front, and they, they had them to, to see to it, you know, so the seed would fall in a little group, you know, they, yeah. they, they used to have seed what they used for them using them. No. It didn't work very Oh man, that looks slick. When they used to use it, it didn't work. Can you plug that in? Can I see that? I want a picture. Yeah. 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 I'm going to try to get that in there. That's a... <coughs> on a soft gumbo, that looks like it worked pretty good. Make a good part. It'd be good for the side. You know, instead of... It's not sold it out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this thing, you know, we've got a picture of. That's the beauty yeah, of it. It's not plowing cloth. Emo. But it's yeah. still... It's still... It's still providing some loose dirt where the command's not working, and so yeah. if that thing uh, works, that would be pretty cool. I'll get a picture of it up here. Uh, we pulled it over 5,000 acres or so last year. Yeah. I mean, is it like a, a better roller, you know, a three point hitch roller? Yeah, it's just a big roller, and I had iron wrapped around it. Kind of, I mean, it looks like angle iron. It's actually not, but it looks like angle iron. There are a couple of things I'm going to tweak on it over this past year. but. Uh, and you build it yourself? Mm -hmm. I'm not toying around with trying to imagine it. Or I am. I don't want to set it out in this group, you know. Yeah, I mean, I am trying to be honest with you, I am trying to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there any other? I mean, we got other stuff we can talk about. <laughs> programs. Yeah, Tim. I know we like the hybrid of the division on the horizon. I'll throw it up. I've not noticed it, but if you notice any particular variety or number being better than another one on the road rise, like hybrid wise? Yeah, I, I don't, I haven't. Did you see it somewhere? Seen one. No, I haven't seen it's one like Jim and I do, but I mean, you know, I haven't noticed one that's going to just stand up better than the other one. I mean, I've had good luck. I've, I've had almost every one on the rows, and I've, I've been pleased with every one, really. I have, I know the one thing that we have been watching out, and I know uh, 
people were, you know, sheep block. And, just, and well, you know, I went and looked at that 760 and that farm. It's weird, you know, sheep block is an organism that loves water. But here we are in row rice and at the top of the, at the top of the fields where it's the driest. I mean, Tim called me worried about it and he was definitely should have been worried about it. every step he didn't have to push it back or was sheep lot everywhere. And uh, so it's just something just to watch you. When we first started row rice, I never even worried about sheep light and you see a lot more of it than you really think you should see out there. I think you're going to see a lot more of it because uh, you're going to rotate the soybeans back and forth and those well, chemistries overlap with the plant side. You're going to have to be a lot more careful with that. Yeah. Even if you're using hydrants, because the chemistries are the same. Yeah, and we, I, I mean, still didn't spray that. You still didn't spray it? It was, it was fine. I mean, it was there, it just didn't come yeah. out, but it didn't yeah. come out the top. And that was a lot, I mean, that was the most sheep light I've seen in a while. <laughs> we saw a lot of it, and it, it was. It was and I don't know if it's because of it's being stressed out a little bit more and it's just allowing more stuff to get into the system like it's a, yeah uh, with with that, we, we did some work a number of years ago I was involved with. We looked at we leaf wetness on a flooded field versus a row rice field. And the, the leaves were wetter longer in a row rice field than they were in a flooded field. And that was initially what we, we thought that had to be wrong. So we changed sensors and did all kinds of funny stuff. And then we thought about it for a bit. I think about water as an insulator and a dip temperature differential in a flooded field between the leaf and the water is less because the water holds the heat at night and so whereas in, in a row rise field it, it cools down a lot cooler so that temp temperature differential is more and it lasts longer into the day whereas a flooded field might be more or less equilibrated or dry by 8 or 9 o'clock a row rise field might be 10 or 11 o'clock so think about that in terms of your your disease, mm -hmm. and that's probably the basis for what's happening. Is there any other questions about the row rice or did you follow back up with that? No. So the I, now, if any other questions you have on it, you can interject at, at any time. Um, I guess the reason I'm, I'm, I'm up here today is uh, part of the uh, our Smart Rice Initiative at Rice Tech is, is working with Grow Rice and, and specifically working with the automated irrigation systems that, that help farmers uh, better irrigate their, their rural rice crop. Um, a couple of years ago, we partnered with a, a company that has a booth out here, Aquarius, uh, to move some of these systems that, that would automatically turn on and off wells and sense uh, moisture levels out in the row rice field to help make better water decisions. Uh, kind of what, I guess what I've seen is the typical way that, that somebody would hear me a row rice field is just a, a set schedule, no matter, you know, barring a huge, a huge rain, whether it's every other day or every three days, uh, using these systems and with proper sensor placement, I mean, there's the ability to save a lot of water. Uh, if you want to, let me just put up a, that you put on the I, I know uh, Ryan Solvich in the room, he's got several of these systems on his farm. But but any of these systems, I mean, they all they all uh, kind of start with something that you put on your well that communicates with the internet and talks to the well. And then you, you add different sensors as you go, depending on what you need, whether it's a, a uh, soil moisture sensor or if you're trying off your well in your which I know we're not really focusing on that today, there's water level sensors. Um, and I mean, the, for those of y'all that are, are growing real rice, are y'all using any kind of sensor technology right now to determine watering times, or are you just set, setting a water schedule? We just made it up as we went last year. <laughs> There's not, it's not an every three day thing. How, how fast the well can get back around a lot of time. Once a week, once every five days. Yeah. 
What size fields were you growing up? What size fields were you? Are they most of them were forty by uh, forty acre fields, quarter by quarter type yeah. deal, um, yeah. and and that that no bigger than sixty five acres. Uh, I know I've tried several of these units out uh, with customers on farms. Um, I guess the biggest the biggest hurdle to go over is, is if you really look into the, the, what the moisture levels, a lot of times we're probably over watering this row rise. With all the research we have from the university and uh, everybody on, on when you're watering. And uh, throughout the years, as farmers would use this, they're actually stunned at the, about how much shorter they have got their water down. Um, the good news is, I guess on these systems, there's, there's a lot of uh, government funding projects out there for it. And uh, the reason Merle's here today is, you know, he's, I know the government's complicated and it's hard to make that closely, but somehow he's mastered it. Okay. First of all, I'd like to ask, how many of you have equip or CSP contracts? Oops. Okay. Do any of those include irrigation management equipment? Got one here, any, any more? Uh, how many of you are really happy with your NRCS office? <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> that that's going to be a whole different thing. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this because some of you have done this and, and it's going to be old, old hat to you. I'll run through it fairly fast. I've left the pamphlet in the back on uh, doing an irrigation water management program. It, it relates mostly to Arkansas's conditions. And I'll talk mostly through that part of it. Uh, basically, the, as we're moving forward with water management, the, the integration of, of automation is coming along pretty fast. There's a lot of companies involved in it, but it is an expensive thing. It's, and it's something new and it's something that we need to take time to understand. So the question is who's going to pay for this and how do you pay for it? So I'm going to go through uh, really quickly a little bit on, on using the equip program looking at what's coming up this year and it's going to be pretty much the same for the, the bordering states on how how you might use that to help you with the uh, uh, acquisition of equipment as you know there's a difference between csp and equip equip is primarily equipment two to three year contracts csp is five year contracts they don't specialize a lot on equipment they have uh, sometimes a program where they pay up front, but you have to do the practice first. Uh, here, the idea is to do a program or uh, submit a program that will get approved. I, I can ask you how many of you have had programs or, or applications sitting in an office for one year, two years, three years, four years? Uh, you have that. Basically, if you have that, pull it out, start over, and do it differently. Because if it wasn't approved before, it's probably never going to get approved in the future. The rules are changing as it goes along, and it's very important to know how to do it. There's two things, building the program and then making it saleable to or being able to get it approved through the channels, okay? It's really important that you get maps, and this is one thing I find that a lot of farmers resist. You've got these maps already. Get the maps, draw on that map everything that exists in terms of water management, Take another copy of that map and put everything you want on that map in 10 years. Look 10 years down the line and say, this is what I want this to look like. This is how I want my farm to operate. Because it's going to be very difficult if you start changing every two or three years going a different direction. You'll never get it right. And a lot of people don't do this or they don't understand this. You have to if you're in Arkansas, and I think the other states do a water plan. To do a water plan, you have to have that information. You have to know where the wells are. You have to know what you need to do to, to make that work. So that's the beginning process. Uh, keep that information because you're going to need that as you go through, through it. Uh, at least in Arkansas, we have the, the this is the new one for, for 2020 forward. Uh, irrigation water management uh, specifications. Uh, what, it, what is important about that? Can I poke? Can I? Yeah, the right there. The red button. Okay. 
This one's different than before. You have a plan and you have to decide what you're going to do, how you're going to reach it, say in, in your final years. You have a choice of basic, intermediate, or advanced water management. Now, those pay differently on most things as, as you're building this plan. What's very important to remember, if you come in and you say, well, I'm gonna go to advanced right away, I'm gonna buy all the irrigation management I need, we're gonna go there, and then uh, two or three years later, you come back and you wanna do a CSP on an intermediate, you cannot do that. The way it's structured now with NRCS is you can only go forward, you can't go back. So it's better, at least I would advise people, or I do advise people, start maybe here, pick different things, do that for three years, get the equipment you need, get used to it, and then go into the longer term projects. Because if you jump off in the deep end right away, and you come back in after your five year CSP, you can't go back and do it again. It's done. So it's very important to do that, to work through that and think more farther down the line in that first uh, plan that you're doing and have that ready to go. Okay? <clears throat> when you build a project, and this is, this is how it is in, in Arkansas now, it gives you some idea, can you see that? You can get, uh, this is the water plan. If you have basic, uh, they pay per acre on 30 acres or less, 30 acres or more. You can see what it is, and this is getting paid for that practice. So that takes you back to the previous slide, and you're getting paid to do that practice. Now, if you start looking at equipment, here we go. Water device, year one, each $673. That could be flow meters, that can be moisture sensors, that can be anything like that that you need. And that's a, that's a fairly, a fairly good uh, payback on that. You go to intermediate with a data, you do one with a data recorder, you're 1,050. And then you go with telemetry, you get $1,300. So those right now, in most cases, will pay pretty much for that device. So you, could, you actually, if you go back to these, these projects and structure them, and look at how you've designed your water system, what you will need, then you can use this to add on to what you need and what you will need. Then this is important to know because you're gonna use that equipment more than one year. You want it to last through that whole project and longer. So, so get it while you can, basically, if you, if you want it. And then you can see here, they, for intermittent flooding, we talked about that. Um, per acre, and, and that is uh, $20.21. So you could jump in and do that, that's per acre. You can jump in and do that, but you never can come back and do it. So if you have your automation over many acres, you're used to it, you're, you're doing it through the equip project, then you're, you're ready for that. Okay? Then let's look at some of the other uh, funds that are available. Let's go down to 533 uh, pump automation, each 210. Now this one is, this is if you're basic, if you're intermediate, they assume that your management level is higher, you've probably got automation, more automation out there. It's 1767.81 for, for pump automation. The HU is the uh, uh, underserved or beginning farmers. And I, I I really can't stress, any of you can get qualified for beginning farmers, do it and take advantage of it. And a lot of the farmers I talk to are older people and I say, well, your kids are worth more than you thought. Think through this, 60%, 90%, it's a big, big jump. If you go to advanced, it's $5,630 you get for uh, pump automation. And really, one of those can probably set you up to read sensors over many of your, much of your farm fields, so you can build off of that. Okay? Let's look at some of the other, other uh, areas where you can obtain funding for that. Flow meters are, are essential. They have those, and those are uh, 
paid out by the inch or the size. And you, if you look at that uh, mechanical index, $118 or $119 per inch. So you take it times six, nine, whatever size of pipe you've got, and that adds up pretty well. If you go up to the, to the more advanced with telemetry, it's something like 300, almost $300 per inch. And that will definitely pay for those. So there you go. You, you've got your water plan that you did to start with. You go back through, you look at that, you write down all of these things, and then you come back and you can budget them into those projects. Now this I put in just, just so you had some idea of, of things that a lot of times the growers don't know they can get funding for. Polypipe. Uh, Surge valves, quite good funding on surge valves. Uh, regular pipes, drop pipes, and all these structures. So that goes back to getting your plan together. Put all of that in there and you have it. Now, one thing that happens a lot of times, people say, well, I'm not a millionaire, even if I have to do this cost share thing, I can't do it in one project. Don't worry about that. Break it up into projects. You have a long-term plan, do it step by step by step. Um, and, and then but going back to the getting them approved, <laughs> these are um, resource concerns. These are the different ones you had on there where you see the X. These, you want to have as many of these resource concerns addressed as possible because that's points for getting your project approved. And these, these are sort of things you need to consider. Soil quality, erosion control, integrated pest management, soil compaction, wildlife, duck flooding, and so forth. Putting these in that contract so you get the points to get it approved. If you go in and you just say, I want to buy water management equipment, and eh, no, you'll never get there. You have to add some things into it to make it more viable. And then when you get the report, make sure you have, whoops, I'll go back there. Make sure you have your, um, job sheet and that tells you exactly what you have to do and what NRCS has to do. That is your contract. Okay? If any of you have any questions on that, I'll be around. I put these sheets in the back for you to look at that go through the process a little bit uh, hopefully clearer than I did and slower than I did. Uh, but this is one of the best sources for getting the equipment that you need for the water management. Okay, thanks. Uh, I guess to wrap it up, if you're a 68 holder and you need credit hours, the sheet's in the bag. Um, you know, three unique topics, I guess, in, in one forty minute session, it's hard to cover everything. Uh, just put a plug into our, uh, our partner and Rice Tech. Um, Aquarius has a booth out here. Any questions you have on the kind of hardware system, please talk about it and talk to them. Rice Tech also has a booth that we man. Uh, Still looking for seed for over ice this year. Come talk to us. <laughs> uh, and it will be around questions, or I guess, the, the rest of the conference. Just grab one of us. Uh, thanks for coming. Anything else? I mean, we got two minutes if somebody.